Uh, we are kicking off a brand new series today called Generation Gap. I am excited about this series because I think we live in a culture that does a great job of causing division. And in division, there, there's definitely a strategy at play in dividing and conquering. And, and we see this a lot, especially with generations. How many of you, uh, let's, let's do it this way. We'll start at the top. How many of you in the room right now, by show of hands, are over the age of 50? Hands up. All right. How many of you in the room right now are under the age of 30? Hands up. Put them way up, 30, under 30. Put them up. All right. They're all shy. They don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, can I text that to somebody? Um, how many of you are in the middle from 40 or 30 to 50? Hands up. All right. So you can see that our church is pretty diverse in regards to generations. Now, I'm going to tell you, in the 830 service, it was staggering. Okay, 837 is about what? Probably 90%. 90% of the room was 50 and up. All right. And then the other half of the room was the rest of us, or the other 10% of the room was the rest of us. And, uh, and I love the fact, and, and it changes each service. Uh, you know, the 1130, um, we used to call that the hangover service. Um, <laughs> it's real life, folks. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, 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 but the, the demographic in that service will change too, uh, the, the generations that are there. But what I love about that, I, I get to be stuck in the middle, all right? I was born in 76, so I'm actually technically a Gen Xer, all right? But the millennials started in the early 80s, some say even around 1980, and so I think the term is Xennial. I don't even know I had a name, but there's that term where you kind of get to see both in. I was raised by a boomer, and, uh, and so I get the okay boomer phrase because that's my dad, and my mom, but also that I relate a lot to some of that stuff. And so this series, as we were talking about it, Aaron and I and, and Pastor Brandon in Gainesville, we were laying out the series or sermon calendar this year, and Aaron brought up the idea of doing something pointed towards generations. Now, here's the reality. Last week was an awesome week. We had a fantastic Easter here at Real Life Church. I hope you were blessed from it. Uh, I think we had somewhere between 17 and 1,800 people come through Real Life last weekend. It was crazy. Listen. That's all, that's all well. Here's the good news. 14 people said yes to Jesus yeah. Christ for the first time. Yeah. And uh, we love that. Uh, Gainesville exploded. All right. Gainesville, a real life Gainesville. Uh, Gainesville has a population of about 753. 223 people showed up to Gainesville yeah. real life. And uh, they didn't. They didn't quite know what to do in that little airplane hangar up there in Gainesville. But, uh, but they had a great day. Six people said yes to Jesus Christ at Gainesville. And so it's a, it's a, it was a great weekend. And so what they say strategically is when you have a big Easter service, what you need to do the week after is, man, you got to do a series where everybody comes back to it. So you got to try to hit a felt need. you got to be talking about something that's going to impact people. You know, where is God when bad things happen? Where it's, it's that kind of feel, all right? But we said, you know what? I think there's an issue. And it's an issue I think that needs to be addressed. And so we put Generation Gap right in here in between Easter and Mother's Day. And so for today and next week, we're going to be talking through this. And so now that you kind of know, uh, Aaron... Uh, and Aaron is our location pastor here at Mountain Home. He handles this location and he has to put up with me probably more than anybody else does on, on our team here at Real Life Church. But Aaron is, I'm not going to say he's half my age, but he's pretty close to half my age. And, and, and that's intentional. Um, I didn't realize the value of it until he came on board, but I have two other preachers on staff and, and Cody, uh, who leads worship with us sometime has the ability to speak. He hasn't had the chance yet, but has the ability to speak. So of the three preachers, two of them are in their twenties and it's intentional because one of these days I'm going to give out one of these days, God's going to take me right here on a platform on Sunday. I'm going to preach and then poof, fall out right there. And you're going to have to carry me off. And if it's halfway through, just slide in and finish out. All right? <laughs> I hope you all are good with that. It's, I'm going to put it in some, you know, some paperwork so it's official. But uh, one of these days, God's going to, it'll be time for me to transition. And so I prayed a long time, Lord, I don't even know what that looks like. I don't know how to do anything else but preach. 
And if you, wanna, if you don't believe that, you know, surely you got something else. <laughs> I really don't. I really don't. I love doing this. And so I've built a team around me to do where I get to do two things. I get to lead. And so I get to cast vision. I get to preach. I get to pro- proclaim. But then the second thing I get to do is love people. You say, well, that is in your job description. Aren't we all supposed to do that? Yeah. Yeah, but it's what I get to do because I have people like Aaron and Jennifer and Kirby and Brandon and Cody and Judy and Miss Kim and Miss Bree and, and the whole team of people that, and Tyler and those team that surrounds me and says, hey, you lead and you love and we'll handle the nuts and bolts of stuff. And they do such a great job. The difference is generationally we're different. All right. So we're going to talk through some of that today. And I promise here in a little bit, you're going to see where, where we get back to the gospel in this, because I think it's something that we miss. So we're going to dive into a topic that I, Aaron, let's talk about playlist on your phone right now. If I were to guess what's something on your playlist that you would go, I bet you didn't see this coming. 29 years old. What's there? The first service I said my playlist is only Elevation Worship, Hillsong Worship, and Upper Room, and you said I was a liar. You are a liar. <laughs> <laughs> so you would be correct in that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, We hire the broken ones here at Real Life Church, folks. <laughs> we want to be authentic. That's right. It's real life. So, <laughs> But uh, no, so I, when you say eclectic music, um, I am a... I would say jukebox, but now it's just iPod. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, like, I love people's faces when they get in my truck with me, because I only listen to songs for about 45 seconds, and then I'm done with it, and I go to the next one. And one of my favorite things... That's called ADD. That's not called... <laughs> no, that's enjoying the spectrum. <laughs> okay, like, all right. It's all taking right. you on a ride and an adventure. So, but like, so a, few, a few weeks ago, I was with someone, and uh, we went to someone's house real quick to pick something up, and we pulled in, and we were listening to my favorite band uh, I like to listen to called Laney. And we pulled in, listened to them, so it's kind of synth heavy, and uh, it's, I mean, it's mainstream radio now. Um, but then when we got back in, it was, uh, I'm pretty sure it was George Strait when we got back in. And he just went, whoa, what just happened? And uh, I was like, I mean, you never know. It's like, it could be a TV show of what you're going to listen to in Aaron's truck. Um, but like, if you pick a name an animal and you've got a 70s band, then they're going to be in my playlist also. Gotcha. Because right. my dad uh, is 10 years younger than his sister, was 10 years younger than his sister. And one of the parents' rules for her to go on a date to a concert, he had to go with them. So he went to uh, he went to the Beatles and he went to the Eagles, which I'm the one that told you Vince Gill's now the lead singer of the Eagles. Yes. How many of you knew that Vince Gill's now the lead singer of the Eagles? Yeah. And it's so pretty epic. He so. went um, he went to all those kind of concerts, and so I grew up listening to those in his truck. Kaylee just got me a new Eagles vinyl for my birthday a couple of months ago. Um, but then you get into yes, the basic Drake. Kanye, all that that's out right now. I'm listening because you got to stay relevant. Um, I mean, be uh, cultivate culture. Don't be cultivated by it. Um, is what I said. Um, but then like emo bands through the 2000s, boys like girls, all those. Those are there. That's Yours, mine. Wow. I got you mentioned this in the first service, and I thought you know that real life church. We need to be a safe place. Amen. Like oh, people should be able to come with things from their past and lay them down at the altar. And I feel like you did that in the first service when you actually confessed being into boy bands. Oh, that's, it's not just into boy bands. Life goal, and I don't know if I'm gonna say it's off the table, is to be in a boy band. Like, microphone with the big foam top, wind condenser on the end of it, like, um, Did you yeah. wear like the overalls with the one strap down stuff? Okay, okay, I hadn't. When Backstreet Boys Millennium came out, okay, when Millennium came out, I won it that way. I was in first grade, and hold on, I had- hold on. <laughs> Everybody just heard the context of that. That was not in first grade when Backstreet Boys came out. How many of you just got a little nauseous in your stomach right there? <laughs> I was in first grade. And I had an AM FM transmitter microphone that I would hook to one stereo on one side of the living room. And then I had another stereo on the other side that I would put the CD on. So I would perform a concert and I had a whole white outfit to match the album cover. 
I did the big puffy vests with <laughs> denim, the chain ball necklaces, the spiky hair. <laughs> His so, wife is like, sweet Jesus. <laughs> it's all coming out yeah. on the stage right so, now. And I'm not sure if I've given up on that yet. Yeah, well, <laughs> I told him in the last service I was going to have it queued up just at the right time. Aaron's going to be like, bye, bye, bye. Like, <laughs> it was going to be awesome. I grew up on boy bands also. They were just called Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue. <laughs> um, That's Kaylee. Yeah. Kaylee. Kaylee, his wife, is wearing a Journey t-shirt this morning. And, uh, and I, she was like, generation gap. I'm like, no, 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 hold on. Journey is timeless. There is, there's no one generation. Because my sons are tw- 15 and 13. And the moment uh, Don't Stop Believing comes on, they're singing just as loud as anybody else in the car. So, Did anybody uh, listen to Faithfully and you play the trumpet part with the horn in your car? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. So maybe it's just it's me. Sorry. So, so music is eclectic, and, and I, my musical taste came out of rebellion. I was a preacher's kid, and so on Sundays, I grew up in a very southern gospel home, uh, which is no problem. I enjoy that. I still have that on my play. If I were to play you some of the southern gospel I have on my playlist, you'd be like, what church do you pastor? Um, but I grew up singing with my family, so we would sing like cathedrals or the Gold City or the Kingsman type of quartet music. Um, and, but once I hit my teenage years, I was like, what's the most opposite of Southern gospel music and appetite for destruction came out about that time. And so guns and roses. And then through that, I really, in, so any of the, what I would call that 80, late eighties, early nineties, glam rock type of stuff, poison, Molly crew. And that fed into what you didn't have the hair for. I did then I did then, um, <laughs> When you tease it so much, it goes away. Um, what's, what's awesome is like there are people right now getting an image of me with teased big rock hair. It's not good. Um, but I, so my kids even, like you guys have heard me joke about Brinley. Um, when Brinley yells for Jennifer in the house, occasionally she'll drop lyrics and she'll be like, Mama! And then there'll be a pause and then she goes, Ooh, <laughs> and so um, nailed that. Uh, so yeah, I think it is. I mean, you pass on those things, like you said, with your dad passing on, and I did. Mine is passed on. Um, I don't know that I listen to a lot of stuff that's current, other than country. Uh, I listen to a lot of country now, especially traveling. Country is good driving that's, music. That's if I'm making a trip, I'm listening to country music. Right, like it's the U.S., the South. Seeing the scenery, you just have to have what fits to it. Yeah, probably if you were to ask me what the least amount of music I have on my playlist um, is Christian music. Um, and don't judge, okay? Um, I just, there's a lot of it that's very repetitive to me. And so... You can only listen, sometimes you can only listen to one song for a whole drive. Like, yeah, your whole drive is one song. Yeah, so there, I always joke about um, some of the worship music being what I call seven eleven songs. It's seven lines eleven times, um, and so I, I struggle with that. But uh, but yeah, so I all kinds of crazy music. But it's, it's but music is is timeless. Like it's an essential. Like you almost have to have music in your life. Yeah. It's just a matter of how you listen to it. It's not eight tracks anymore. It's just on your phone and it's ready available. So with, with music being something that goes generationally, one of the things that I, one of the, I think has changed over generation is, is connection uh, or trust. I'm going to go back to trust because I grew up, growing up where I did in the, I grew up up north in Michigan. Anybody, any northerners in the house? Some of you are scared. It's okay. It's all right. Um, they're like, can I say, uh, uh, marry a native, then you get to stay. Um, so we, we grew up in Michigan. And so I can remember being nine years old and at nine years old, I would get up in the morning in Michigan. I would leave the house about 7am on my bicycle and I would be gone until the sun went down. And if the sun went down quicker than I was ready on the way home, and there was no cell phones, there was no, I mean, there were pay phones, but all I had were dimes because in Michigan you could pick up pop bottles in the ditch and go turn them in and get a dime back for every bottle. And so that's how I bought my lunch was, a, you know, the cheeseburgers when they were under a dollar. And so, but I would be on the way home and I would be like waving at everybody as they passed and praying a truck would stop. 
And as the truck would stop, I'd go, I live right up the road. Can I throw my bike in the back? Hop in the back. And I'd throw my bicycle in the back of a strange guy's truck, and they would give me a ride home. Now, generationally, I know some parents are like, oh, your parents were demons. Yeah, my parents would have beat me if I yeah, jumped your parents in someone's would have truck. Beat you. Yeah, um, but, but it, was, there was just, it was just a different, it was a different time of trust, I think, where um, maybe it's the, the amount of information. We didn't have as much information, so we didn't know what to trust and what not to trust. And now we have all the information, and so we don't trust anything. But that was a, that's something that I, I ache for my kids, where I go, man, I wish that, like, A, I wish they'd get on their bicycles and go ride around town, um, get them out of the house. Um, but I, I miss that they don't have some of those adventures that I had, that me and my brother had. We'd stop by the lake and, and swim for a while or, you know, f- meet up friends wherever. And, you know, I think you and I were talking about, like, the neighborhood baseball games, yeah. you know, or wiffle ball games that would start up. And, and now if you have a baseball game, you have to find a park. You have to find, the, you know, where we were. How many of you grew up having to yell? We're good. Let me repeat that. Uh, how many of you grew up having to yell car because you were playing in the street? <laughs> yeah, like. Good times. And now you got to cut a big check because of travel ball. Right. It's the only <laughs> right. way you can play. Yeah, 17 uniforms. I had cut off shorts. So. But I, you said connection. And I think one of the things, if you get into a generation gap, is that the authenticity and connection, like we are more connected than ever before. We're more connected than ever before because it's easy and it's accessible. Yeah. But what we lack is authenticity. So how many of you now, if someone knocks on your door or rings your doorbell, you're not immediately going to the door. You're going to find something to take to the door with you first. Mm -hmm. And then you open the door, maybe. Or you're checking the doorbell cam, whatever it is. Um, There's there's a a lack of certainty in, in, in being so connected, we've actually distanced our connections. Mm -hmm. So rather, some of you will be able to remember when you moved at one point in life. And when you moved, there was something that stirred within you about two months later that says, I need to pick up the phone and check on so-and-so, see how they're doing. Now, the connection and the check-in is, well, they've posted something on Facebook, so it looks like they're doing good. I don't need to check on them. Like, I know yeah. they're doing good now. There's not an authentic connection there anymore. There's a, a drop in the comment, oh, everything looks great, call me sometime. But w- there's a pattern we've got into of saying, we should catch up sometime and it doesn't happen. Because everything is so in front of us, then we think that everything's okay, and we begin, it's unfair to people, I think, even at times too, because everything you're seeing is highlight reel. Everything that's getting posted is the best of the best. This is what I want to share with you, but I need you to remember that, I need you to be the person to call me. So yeah. we lack an authentic connection, even though we are so connected. Yeah, I think you used the phrase, we need to get together and catch up. And the problem is we're always caught up. Because of status, because of posts, because of so many different social media outlets. And I think what you said in the last service was really interesting that um, how many of you were the people that grew up telling your kids not to sit too close to the TV screen? How many of those same people are the ones that bought a tablet for their grandkid or their kids so that they would go play? <laughs> uh, it, it shifts. And, and I think that, you know, as much as I want to get all my kids about screen time, in reality, we're on it just as much for different things. It's just different things. And we feel like our stuff is more valuable than their stuff or what they're on it for. And so it has definitely created a separation in, in, that, in that closeness, that community. People say, oh, man, I just, we just need community. We need community. We got to be willing to sacrifice some things to get community. You know, when you're having family dinner, does everybody throw their phone in a bowl so that you're actually communicating with each other. Pastor Vince, if we did that, no one would say a word. I, I promise you that we have a thing in our, our drawer that's at our kitchen table, and it's basically talk boxes. And you open this drawer, and these two boxes can come out, and you just grab one out, and it's a question. If you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? And it's just conversation starters. And you go, you have to do that? Heck, yeah, we have to do that. Because how many of you know what to talk about with other generations? Because sometimes I don't understand them. And I know they don't understand me. And so uh, you got to maybe set some tools that are there. So Yeah, 
You've got to be able to, like, both generations have to have an open line of communication and that. Um, what for you, you mentioned just a bit ago that Zennial, um, so you're between, what is it, or maybe even as a pastor um, sitting in the type of church we do, as, div as diverse as we can be where we live is the kind of church we are. Yeah. Um, for you, what is that like to be like the liaison, like huh. the one in between um, more seasoned and mature and the ones that are like, let's just go for life and figure out what's coming up? I think that a, as you get older, and I'm just going to talk to everybody who would be considered more mature and seasoned, as Aaron put it. Um, you know what he meant, right? <laughs> older. Um, how many of you can relate to this? Your body knows how old you are. But your brain does not. Um, I think for me, the thing that God is showing me in the last probably five years is that, that my brain is catching up with the fact that my season is changing. And when I started ministry 20 years ago, I was the kid preacher. I, I was the kid preacher. And so everybody wanted to hear the kid preacher preach. And what I'm realizing is that much as my brain still likes that attention, I'm learning that that's not the season I'm in. Now, I'm not done preaching by any stretch, but the focus of my ministry is having to shift because what I see, just to answer your question, is sitting where I sit and watching from 70 to 14 and below in our church is that I'm worried. I'm worried that this generation up here has an understanding and Please, nobody take this as a slight. Let me get to the end of it. That this isn't optional. Um, I grew up in a home where this isn't optional. Like nothing trumps my time with my community of Christ. And so um, I grew up where we didn't miss church for ball games. We didn't miss church for, you know, we may go on a vacation, but... Um, with current culture, what they're stating now, uh, the average church member, someone who is considered a regular attender in America, it's being in church once every four to six weeks. That's what's considered regular attendance. I didn't grow up in that, but I'm seeing it. And the problem is what happens is that which a generation does in moderation, the generation following it will do it in excess. And so if this is critical to you and, and, and I go, well, I mean, I'm there most of the time, then the generation that follows will be there less than 50% of the time. And then the generation that follows will make it maybe a quarter of the time. And then so on and so on and so on. That which we do in moderation, that which we set limits or boundaries on. And you go, well, Vince, you got to be healthy and Christianity is not all about the church. It's not all about the church, but you try to get fit, not going to the gym try to maintain it. It's not going to work. And so for me sitting in the seat that I sit in, seeing the scope of our church, I ache because I see generations where, that are going, uh, you mentioned last service, well, my grandpa used to be a pastor. So they have this, but in the, in the scope of one to two generations, the value has been drastically shifted. And so it worries me. It just takes it just takes one gener it just takes one generation to break a pattern or create a pattern. Yeah. It just takes one. Yeah. And so I get I get grief a lot of times because, you know, we don't make our kids come to all three services. But they're coming to a service. Um, and it's it's non negotiable. You know, if you're vomiting, I'll let you stay home. But if you're tired, you can be tired here. Um, and, and it's, it's a non-negotiable. My, uh, all six of my kids have experienced this. And so, uh, people are like, well, I just don't want to push my kid. That's baloney. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. If, if, and if you're offended by that, come talk to me and I will probably offend you more. Um, in, in, in that, <laughs> I, I'm going to, I got to preach on it. Just <laughs> no, I'm going to preach. Okay. All right. All right. Sitting where I sit and getting to sit with students. I have never been able to out-disciple a parent. Right. Nope. 
It's not the way the system's built. It's not the way God intended it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, when he talks about you as a family, you as a parent, the song we sing, and everybody loves the blessing, you know. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face smile upon you. May his favor be upon you until your generation and your children's children. It doesn't say to your congregation's children. Your children's children. The mandate biblically is not that Aaron or myself be the disciple-making force for you. It's that your home be a church in itself. And so the, the pushback, I, parents, go, I just don't want to push them. I just don't want to push them. You will push them in every, you're not quitting this ball team. You signed up for it. You're going to stay till the end. Why? Because that's commitment. Dad, I don't feel like going to church. Oh, it's okay. And then so the story goes. Make them go to church. If you're a grandparent, if you're a grandparent and you have influence, and your kids are adults, and you don't get to tell them what to do. You swing by and make the time. Go pick up the grandkids every week. Get them in the house. Because you can restore a generation. We see biblically that happen all the time. You can restore it. But if we don't take the time to restore it, and if we don't grab the culture and say, this is going to be the culture of our home, then the generation gap, the spirituality gap that we have, will only continue to broaden. We will see Christ in less of a authority role and we will see him as an optional role and we will just assume that is that it's I know the guy I know the guy and that's good enough it's not so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump here in just a second I want to we have a responsibility as I said I'm getting older and I'm realizing that that God is gonna he's still called me to ministry I'm gonna pastor until you know like I said one day that I fall down and hope somebody steps in and takes over. Um, but I also know this season of my life, I'm getting to the place where God is going, how long is that going to be? I'm like, as long as you need me. And he said, what are you doing for those that follow? How are you pouring into those that follow? And so I have a lot of people on my team um, that are great. I have a great team and I trust them all. But those of you that have followed me in real life for the last 10, 12 years know that I am extremely partial to this portion of real life church. I like it. But I think the greatest honor that God has given me at this season in my life is that I now have an opportunity and I now have a trust to go, I don't have to be the one that's giving you the message because God has put people in my life like Aaron. Just put people in my life like Brandon that stand up here and whether you know them as well or not, what I know is that they love this house as much as I do. And so it's a great thing as I'm getting older and as I'm reaching this different season of my life that God is going, now Vince, you have the decision to make and go, are you going to hang on or are you going to invite him to the table? And so this morning... I'm not going to hang on. I'm going to roll out. And I'm going to invite Aaron to the table. And I'm going to let him talk to you for a few minutes about the reality of this generation gap and what it is we can do to fix it. So, Aaron, what do you think? So, When we were walking through this um, at the beginning of the week, and we are sitting in the pastor's office, and uh, as we left, generation gap we both walk out the door and he walks out, goes down the hallway and I walk out the back hallway and down the stage. And I said, look, even generationally, we take different exits. And he said, yeah, it's because mine's good with behind the scenes and yours longs for the stage. And I said, well, you might be a little bit right in that. And, uh, but what I want to walk through today is such a simple passage. And we were walking through this and we we're trying to think about where we wanted to go in this week and the week to follow. Um, we go prodigal son and we talk about how it was, it was the father and the one generation beyond the son that had compassion and had grace and was able to, to welcome the son back to the seat at the table when it was the same generation within that had the animosity. It was the brother towards the son where the brokenness was taking place. And we're sitting there wrestling, going back and forth and talking with Brandon on where to go. And it became so simple. And it says this in Matthew 19. 
starting in verse 13. If you've grown up in church, you're gonna know what this short little story is. But it says, then the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and they went away. In this moment, there's a seat at the table. When you were growing up and you had Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner or, or the family get together, there was probably two types of tables in your house. You had the kids table and the grown up table. And at those tables, you know, the, the kids one had the short chairs or the short table or, or was the poker table you just threw a, a tablecloth over and pulled some chairs up to, or you didn't even have seats and they sat on the floor of the table. And then there's the grown-up table that had the good plates and actual glasses and all the things that you wanted to take care of because you prepared a spot at the table. But then there came a moment where whatever holiday, whatever season it was, there's a year that someone came up to you and they said, hey, why don't you come sit at the grown-up table? As a kid, your first thought was, I'm gonna go sit at the kid table. This is my habit, this is my routine, this is where I sit. Until someone said, why don't you come sit at this table with us? And the opportunity was presented. You see, as the church, as a place for the broken, as a place for the hurting, for the confused, for the doubting, for the depressed, we have to have a seat at the table. And it's not just, hey, go sit at the kids' table and we'll get to you and bring you something in a minute. But sit at the real table. Sit with me, sit next to me so we can have conversation and you can walk us through what's going on in your life. You see the disciples in this passage, so many times it's broken down, like the children were coming and the disciples immediately shunned them away because it was their moment. Don't get close to Jesus. He doesn't have time for you. He has so much other stuff to take care of. But the disciples in this moment were only doing what they had caught. They were doing what the generation before them had showed them to do when they came to the teachers of scripture. And it was, your time will come, but right now, let the grown-ups sit at the table. But Jesus does only what Jesus can do when he breaks a generational pattern. And he says, no, 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 no. Let them come for theirs is the kingdom. You see, if we ever want something to happen in our next generation, we have to begin to allow it to happen right now. Otherwise we're gonna lose and we're gonna miss them. If you looked at the statistics, pastor mentioned the one just in church attendance alone, one in six weeks, average church attendance. The generation that's coming up right now and Gen Z and those to follow, are the most informed generation of all time because everything is immediately in their hand. Instant gratification, instant information. And they are searching for answers. But where are they going? It's not the church. In fact, it's not church, it's not religion in general. The number one place they go to look for answers is the internet. The number two place is friends that are in the same seasons of life as them. Number three, teachers. Number four, any other kind of avenue. Five, parents. Six, religion. So before they're even getting to you, parent, they've gone through four or five other options to get an answer what they're walking through in life. Sex before marriage, Christian teenagers are more likely to have sex before marriage than those not plugged into church. Something is broken, something is mattered. The pattern is messed up. But where are we giving them a seat at the table? One of my, my greatest passions is the local church. And the pattern that we're watching now is not one of increase, it's not one of cl climbing, it's not one of growth. It's the opposite. 
and I'm not dismissing any generation because every generation has its flaws. Some are entitled, all are entitled when it comes down to it. Some are more informative, some are, but if you look at these children, they wanted to come to Jesus. They wanted to come and learn. They wanted to sit next to him. They wanted him to pray for him. But yet the disciples who were merely a few years older than them, 15, 16, 17, couple pushing into their twenties. Those disciples don't look at them as then, hey, Jesus picked me. They said, no, 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 wait your turn. And then he'll get to you. I think too many times, whatever generation it is, we've said, wait your turn. And then we'll ask you. But when we wait and we wait and we wait, it becomes too late. And patterns and rhythms and different ideals. And if we do not begin to give opportunities for teenagers and next gen and, and millennials to pick something up and go and get it, which could further the gospel. No, the gospel will prevail ultimately. Yes, Jesus will get his message out, but it's gonna be saturated. And who's going to listen to it? So we have to be able to say, hey, you know what? I, I know you're broken and I know you're hurting, but if you come sit at the table with me, let me tell you about when I was sitting in the same place you were. Too many times we get to the spot in a generation and I do it myself and I look back and I say, what are you doing? Why, why are you making those decisions? That doesn't make any sense. Forgetting the fact that just a few years prior, was sitting in the same seat, making some of the same decisions. But if we're gonna be a church that's gonna reach people and people are gonna be confident with coming in, they're gonna come in broken, they're gonna come in hurting, and they're gonna be able to sit at the table, we always have to have a seat at the table. So how are we preparing our table? What does your table look like in your personal life? Is it immediately a filter that's, oh, those kids, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're doing. Is it immediately a, man, those old people, they just don't get it. They just don't get the weight of what I'm going through right now. So where's the brokenness? The brokenness is in the fact that neither will listen to the other. And there has to be a sacrifice on both ends. Young people have to recognize that people have gone through life and they're matured and they're understanding and they're speaking from a place of experience that they want to believe and invest in them. And old people, you have to recognize that not all the time are young people just looking to be lazy and not do anything. Actually, some of the times their dreams are so big that they're actually overwhelmed and not sure how to chase them because there's so much information and there's so much desire for them to make a difference. They just don't know where to go or what to do with it. So how can we come together? And say, you know what, if you had this kind of work ethic and you begin to respect people like this and you begin to do this, then your dream will begin to take off. And you begin to sit and you begin to mentor with people to say, and watch the kingdom of God grow because there's not a generation gap because there's a passion for the gospel to be furthered. But there's gotta be a seat at the table whether it's, hey, I went to college and I'm, I'm back home now and I'm gonna settle in for a minute, I'm gonna start a family, we gotta get back into church. If it's the person that's gone through divorce after divorce after divorce, I'm not sure where to go now, but I know I can come sit back at the table because the door is open at church. Is it the person that just has nowhere else to go and nowhere else to turn, but the person that sits next to them at work invited them to sit at the table? The disciples didn't know any better. They were just doing what they were taught. What are we teaching? Are we teaching that the gospel is so important and so impactful that you get to pick it up and take it with you daily? Is it something that we're saying you need to wake up every morning and so your kid sees you studying in the moment, studying scripture where he walks in and he says, are you reading Jesus? Yes, son, I'm reading Jesus. Are you having these moments that begin to shift a pattern, that begin to break a generational curse and a generational pattern? All it takes is one. Because like I said, there's a lot of people you could go to today and they say, where'd you go? What'd you do? Went to church. What church? Real life. Man, that's awesome. I hear great things about it. My daddy, my granddaddy, they used to be a pastor. Well, where do you go? Oh, I don't. I got busy. The church wouldn't want me. 
excuse after excuse after excuse. But I wanna do this today. I'm not gonna ask anybody to come up and pray at the altar. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. I wanna do this. I wanna pray over us as a church. To be a church that has a seat at the table, no matter the generation, for the one to say, I'm excited about what Jesus has done in my life. At seven in real life kids, or 70 for the first time in this room right here. Because it happens every week. Life change takes place no matter the age. So with every head bowed and every eye closed in this moment, I wanna do this church. I want us to come together. I want us to be a place that we can have communication with each other. We can ask big questions. Pastor Vince is about to come out and walk through communion with us. But in this moment, what can you do to make a difference in your generation and one to follow? I remember growing up that there were those sweet old ladies that would teach Sunday school. There were the crazy youth pastors. There are the people you saw every week at church. And there is a community because this is what we did. And this is who we are. And lives are gonna be impacted and changed because we're a family. No matter the generation, no matter the differences, we're gonna to come together and we're gonna to pray together. We're gonna to support each other. And we're gonna reach people for the gospel. So God, today I thank you that we get to be in your house, God, that you've made a way. God, I thank you for this house, God, and, and what you have in store for it, God, and the people that are gonna come through these doors and the ones that already have. God, I pray for those in this room. Could they be intentional about the moments that they get to see a generation rise up? God, because your church will not fail. God, your message will prevail. God, we wanna be a part of that. We don't want to be a part of the realignment where everything has to be reshifted and brought back and all that's shaken up. Let us be the ones to do it. God, let us be the ones that further the gospel. Let us be the ones that break the pattern. God, where the division has been created, God, we come together in unity under the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for our pastor. I thank you for his family. God, for this team to go and to reach people and the vision that's been placed there. God, I pray for them. God, I pray for the people in this room that you give them boldness and confidence, God, to have real conversations with people, to learn something new. God, I thank you that we get to be here and all that you have in store. And God, we pray that lives continue to be impacted and changed for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, just before we go into communion, I want you to think about, I want that. That night that Jesus took the disciples and he went into that upper room and he established this idea of communion. Sometimes, sometimes we, we forget. Um, Chris, how old are you? Stand up. Come here. This is how old Jesus was in that room. It's 33. I know we get this picture sometimes that, oh, all the years of maturity and all the, and now he's Jesus, I get that. But the disciples in the room of the 12 that were there, there would have only been a few, if any, that were older. John would have been much younger. Peter, probably a little closer, at least in his mid to late 20s maybe a little older, Matthew a little older based on his education and his profession, but some of them were young. And what made the table so amazing was that they were allowed to sit at it. And so as you come to take communion today, obviously I want you to see the reality of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, that it was broken for you, it was poured out on your behalf, that remembering Jesus. But as you take it, I want you to look at your table, your table. Do you have a few people that you're pouring into? Do you have a few people that you're going, I need to make sure that, 
I need to make Chris's, I've got, I've got a couple years on Chris. I need to make sure I'm available if Chris needs me. If Chris wants to talk about something and it's not church, we've had talks about business. We've had talks about just things he's walking through and he's got to have people that he can look up to. But if he doesn't have people that he can look up to that are actually looking down and respect, then a break happens. And God forbid the church be guilty of this. Thank you, Chris. I am going to confess in this moment. I've done this before. As I said earlier, my body knows how old I am. My brain sometimes doesn't. And if I could tell you the number of times that I have missed the opportunities God gave me to truly pour into somebody. Just missed it. I missed it out of arrogance. I missed it out of lack of importance to me in the moment. I've I've missed it off just being, being so focused on me and what God was calling me to do. I missed the fact that he was asking me to pour the call into someone else. And so I'm just as guilty. And so the table should remind us, look at your table. Who's around it? Who are you pouring into that's half your age? Oh, Vince, they drive me nuts. Well, then step away from the table and remember that not so long ago you were driving people nuts. It was you. Be different. Pour into them. Give them something for tomorrow. God didn't give you all the knowledge, all the wisdom, all the blessing that he gave you so that you'd have a really cool eulogy. He gave it to you so you'd give it away.